Next, coverage of the House Rules Committee meeting. Thursday, members worked on the Republican seven-year budget plan and legislation regarding possible U.S. troop involvement in Bosnia. The budget plan aims to balance the federal budget in seven years. Members also discussed a bill that would deny funding for the deployment of U.S. troops in Bosnia. The Rules Committee makes final decisions on how bills will be debated on the House floor. Representative Gerald Solomon of New York chairs the panel. We'll come to order. The first um, matter before the committee is the uh, conference report for the seven-year balanced budget act. And uh, let me just say uh, before I uh, yield to the ranking member and then uh, recognize the uh, chairman of the budget committee, uh, this is something that I personally have waited for for so many years. And I tell you the truth, I never thought it would ever be here, that we would actually be considering a conference report that was going to put us on a balanced budget uh, glide path that we couldn't get off of. And uh, uh, I just can't tell John Kasich, the chairman of the Budget Committee, and uh, Speaker Gingrich, uh, both of whom have kept the entire conference uh, focused on, on moving this legislation along. It was almost an impossibility to do when you consider all of the problems, uh, problems that uh, John uh, Kasich had uh, with me over something called dairy, and uh, that's just one. There were so so many hundreds and hundreds of other things, and uh, so the fact that we're very here is uh, almost somewhat of a miracle. So before I uh, proceed any further, I know that Mr. Moakley has something uh, uh, that he must do right away, and so I will yield to him for any opening statement he might have. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Moakley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. John Casey, my dear friend. I hope you didn't straighten all the problems out I, the same way as straightened out Mr. Solomon's problem. I, I, you'd have five from a balanced yeah. budget. Well, I mean, frankly, we, we went, we had one way to go. We went the utter way, yeah. you know. Well, Get it, Joe? Oh, my brother. Utter. Oh, I, oh, oh. I applaud Mr. Solomon for his dexterity and, yes. and his cunningness and he milked his ability, piece of legislation for his all ability to serve his constituents. <laughs> I'd love to be able to have an in-depth discussion of what's in this gigantuan bill, but <laughs> as you know, the ink is still wet on it, and I think it weighs about five pounds. The way things have been going these days, important programs for no reasons other than to pay for tax breaks for the very rich. And frankly, I can't believe anyone could vote for this horrible collection of attacks on seniors, this horrible attacks on children, and the horrible attack on working families. Mr. Chairman, it's just wrong to cut Medicare, Medicare $270 billion to pay for a $245 billion in tax cuts for the rich. It's wrong to cut child nutrition programs like school lunches by $6 billion. It's wrong to cut student loans by $5 billion. It's wrong, Mr. Chairman, to increase the taxes on working families by $32 billion. And Mr. Chairman, it's wrong to cut all of these programs in order to give more money to the people who don't need it. These cuts are to lower the taxes on the very rich and to lower the taxes on big corporation, and it's just that simple. This bill will hurt the people who need our help and help the people who are already hurting. It takes from the mouths of babes, from the health care of seniors, from the education of students, and gives to the pockets of the very rich. Mr. Chairman, it's a bad idea. It's a mean bill. We ought to send it back to the conference or else to the trash can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me the open statement. <coughs> well, Mr. Moakley, uh, you know, there's an old saying uh, my grandmother used to tell me, the proof is in the pudding, and uh, wait till next year and see what happened. And I am so confident that what we are doing is so right for America that I just cannot wait to get it done. You know, uh, uh, the people that I represent are hardworking people. Uh, I don't think there's a millionaire in the uh, in the entire 22nd Congressional District of New York. There's one. No, there isn't, uh, my friend. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, when, when, when I go home and uh, I go to the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars post or I go to the fire company um, or to the Masonic Lodge or the Knights of Columbus, uh, and I could go on down the line, 
But um, all of the people that I talk to, they are so worried that uh, uh, the amount of money that they're able to accumulate uh, in a paycheck each week or each month or each year is so little that uh, they can't accumulate enough money just to buy a, uh, a down payment on a home. Something that my wife and I did when I was 25 years old, and uh, uh, and we had uh, five children, and we were finally we were able to get those those uh, those kids uh, the home of their own, and uh, then if you look at what's happened over the years with the so much more just taken out of the paycheck every 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 week, it's just impossible today to to save the money for a down payment and to then make the mortgage payments. And that's exactly what this, uh, this legislation does. It brings some responsibility to this government. It shrinks the size and the power of the government, gives it back to the states and the counties and the towns and the cities and the villages and the school districts and the private sector. And it lets this country go and, 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 and run itself the way it should uh, from the private sector. So John, having said all that, I just admire and respect you so much because I'm not too sure there's another member of Congress that could have accomplished it. Uh, between you and Speaker Gingrich keeping all of us focused on this issue. It is an absolute miracle, and I just uh, say God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to mark both of you down as undecided, so <laughs> give that report to the whip. I'd like to uh, just take a second to say that um, I, I personally believe the Congress, and I hope his constituents are listening, I think that it is a tremendous loss to this Congress that Tony Bielenson is going to be yes. retiring. I think it is a terrific loss to this institution. I think he's a terrific man. And um, I've enjoyed working with him over the years. And I hope that um, when I get out, and I'm saying all of this, Joe, because basically when I get out to California, you know, hotel and motel prices are awfully high. No, and maybe they'll have a little <laughs> spare room for me. But no, in all seriousness, I, I'm going to really miss him because he has been over the years when we've been in some very nasty debates <clears throat> he's always had the guts to come forward and uh and bring a real uh big dose of bipartisanship to this process and um i've asked my staff to prepare a letter for me to send to his newspaper because i personally wanted to want to express this to the people in his district and i i hope that they're listening um I hope you'd find out whether that letter is going to help him or hurt him from you. Well, Joe, I'm not sending one to your paper. <laughs> anyway, it's a uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm it's gotten to the point where I carry charts around, even if I'm not going to use them. But this says that if we have these, if we pass this, and we have these lower interest rates, it's kind of hard to believe this. This this presumes that. <clears throat> I'm we have a 2% lower rate. John, I've got to run. Uh, okay. okay. Sorry. Turn off your mic, Joe. Presumes we're going to have a 2% lower interest rate. I, I don't know if it'll be 2%, but a lot of experts say it will be. Some say it'll be better. I, I don't, but I know this. I mean, this is kind of hard to believe, that if you buy a house, costs $100,000, and finance it over 30 years, you will save $37,000 in um, on your off your mortgage because of lower interest Co the average college educational you'll save 2100 the automobile you'll save 900 bucks and my jeep's getting a lot of miles on it <laughs> and this tractor you'll save 1100 so you can go out to get the corn so we can keep pumping that ethanol out there um, this is short term and in the longer term this is I look at these things kind of one way and then conversely Think about if we slide, start sliding towards third world status, which is not inconceivable. Dublin, Ireland is third world That's status. Right. I mean, a lot, few rich and a lot of poor. Uh, what will this home look like in 15 years for, for a young family? I mean, what will it cost to buy the house? And then what will the house look like? I mean, I'm very worried that the house is going to look going to be a lot smaller and it's going to cost a lot more. I don't know what a car will cost then. College education, I mean, the costs of this are through the roof already. I mean, imagine what it's going to look like in 15 years. So we, don't, we really don't have any choice and I, I, to, but to try to get some control over this. And I got to tell you, the Washington Post today, I, I've been hearing people talk about it. 
And so about an hour ago, I, I got it, I slowed down for five minutes, and I read this editorial. I don't know if you've seen this, if you have read. I've read every single word of the editorial. I didn't skim it, I read every word of it. This could be, you know, you read a lot of things, but as of I feel right now, this is probably the most significant editorial I have ever read in my lifetime. Because this really lays down the challenge of the need to be responsible. And I don't want to crow about the fact that the Post, that the Washington Post was kind of singing our song because they're not. They're just singing the song of responsibility. The and the best um, part's right where your, your <coughs> is, best part's right where your finger is about the Medicare. Yeah, it says that we, you know, we really, it took guts to do what we did. Um, I mean, you're going to hear a lot about this editorial. But um, to do otherwise is to hide, to lull the public, and to perpetuate the budget problem they profess to be trying to solve. Let us say it again. If that's what happens, it will be the real default, speaking about the fact that, um, that we cannot uh, politicize and demagogue and destroy this plan. I mean, we need to get the seven-year commitment from the president. We can negotiate and fight over our priorities, but we've got to get the bottom line. And I, I, was, uh, I was very moved by the Washington Post editorial because it took a lot of guts for them to write it. And um, it's as well written. I don't know if I commend it to everybody. And for the people that are watching, I commend them write the post and get the editorial. It's very good. It says it all. <clears throat> I, I'd, I'd say that to the chairman, that the chairman has been a warrior. And I think that if the chairman were in my shoes, he would have been able to carry this job out. I don't have any doubt about it. I think, you know, you've been there frankly, probably before I've been there in this issue. Uh, and it's just a great time. I told the members uh, last night that, um, you know, all the times you leave home and you, your kids are there, your wife's there, your husband's at home, and you're coming into this city, you know, Debbie Price's husband is at home, Jerry, your wife is at home. When you call them up and, and we're, we're away so much, you, you can at least say that we're doing this for a reason. Sure. And, um, it's just a great, great time for us to be able to pass this. And hopefully, at the end of the day, the president will accept seven years. We'll get down to some negotiating, and we will uh, we'll save the country from the slide, inevitable slide towards third world status. And um, we will save the country so that the next generation isn't going to be cheated out of their future. And it's nothing less than a crusade. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. The bill is big and thick and fat and CBO Congressional Budget Office added up the arithmetic. It's not our office. It's the nonpartisan office that infuriates us, us as much as it infuriated Clinton when he did his health care plan. Um, they, they added it up. The numbers add up. We get to a balanced budget, but let's not fool ourselves. This is only a first step. And finally, we have to put it all in perspective. <clears throat> We cannot ask the American people to support a plan to balance the budget that runs against common sense. We have to ask the American people to support a plan that is about common sense. And it's total common sense to have a $3 trillion increase in spending over these next seven years as compared to the last seven years and say that we shouldn't spend any more than the $3 trillion and the $4 trillion that's represented by the status quo. That's how much it would go up. We got to save that. Put it in a cookie jar. Just like when we save things we, for our kids, you take the money, you put it in a cookie jar, you don't spend it. We cannot allow ourselves to start spending that fourth trillion. We cannot allow ourselves to start spending our children's college education. We cannot allow ourselves to start spending our children, mo children's mortgage payments. I mean, that's what it comes down. I don't need any, really any more rhetoric out there. I mean, I, I believe this firmly and appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to the historic debate tomorrow. <laughs> well, John, again, I just want to, uh, I want to commend you. Uh, the only uh, point I'd like to make is the, uh, the Washington Post editorial. Um, I just hope uh, we all read that. Um, John, you were here in 1985, and uh, uh, you know, we adopted a, uh, a budget at that time which was going to bring us to a balanced budget by 1990. And uh, we all know what happened. Uh, we never got there. And uh, it's going to take guts to continue. 
and uh, editorials like that will certainly certainly help because we cannot get off this glide path. We uh, and I hope the American people know that uh, they had better keep the people here that are going to keep us on this glide path because if they don't, you're going to see interest rates skyrocket. You're going to see inflation skyrocket. The na the interest we pay on the national debt skyrocket, and every time that goes up one penny. It's that penny much more that we have that we don't have to uh, to help those people that are truly needy. Uh, how, how much time do you? Can think I, I tell you one piece of this thing that I'm particularly proud of, and that is the fact that we have filled the gap on the earned income tax credit. This is the program that applies to the working right. poor, and when this bill left the House, I believe it was far better than the Senate. Yet it had some flaws in the House version that needed to be corrected. I think if there are any there's any group of people in America that we need to encourage, it's particularly it's single women with children. I think they have a very, very difficult time. And frankly, they don't get represented very well in this city. Uh, I think that's frankly why we were never able to force uh, these irresponsible uh, idiots to not pay their child support. Right. And it was too long. And in the earned income tax credit, we worked the formula so that when coupled with the $500 tax credit, for those that qualify and for those that don't, we gave a more EITC formula. And at the end of the day, in 1996, not one, not one qualifying group will, be, will do worse than current law in 96 or better. And then from 96 throughout, they'll, they'll continue to get increases uh, in the benefits that are designed to reward them for working and ease them into full-time work. And I'm, I'm really, really happy we did that. And we also were able to provide some more money for Medicaid, which was one of the program areas I was most concerned about. And uh, we've put uh, tens of billions more into Medicaid than when we did the budget resolution. And I think it's a, more, it's a, a, a better program as a result. And um, I think we have, uh, we've, we have really smoothed this product out, and we have a superior product than what we had uh, when we first started this process. But that's what kind of evolution is all about. John, if you don't mind, would you shift over to the other chair and let me, uh, we always uh, bring to, in tandem the, uh, the ranking member. And uh, Martin, if you'd come forward and uh, uh, feel, please feel free to summarize your statement. It will appear in the record in its entirety. And, uh, John, if you could wait just a few minutes and, uh, until Martin makes his statement, and then we can have questions of the panel. I don't think there are going to be many questions. Mr. Sabo. I, I th thank the chairman. And uh, before I start the, uh, my statement, I couldn't help respond, though, to the gentleman, the chairman's question about the Washington Post editorial. I would only suggest that the Washington Post indicated the best alternative uh, budget before the Congress was the alternative budget uh, which a group of Democrats offered. How many votes did it get, Martin? Uh, not enough. <laughs> we would have welcomed your vote for, good, for the best option before this session of Congress. And we look for further converts and uh, we're, we're, we wait for John to come to that decision. Oh, I mean, as, I, as always, I got to try to interrupt Martin. <laughs> and, and, and then, John, you could really get no, crazy. What I'm saying is that this is where the fight ought to be, frankly. The fight ought to be right here. <coughs> The Democrats that offered their seven-year budget, which I got to tell you, Martin Sabo voted for, it's all the credit in the world for doing it. That's where the fight ought to be, over what our priorities are within those seven years. But let's at least commit to that. But, Mr. Sabo, go ahead with your uh, remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, what I'm going to ask is a little different, so I think I'll read it. And I don't like normally doing that, but uh, all right. uh, let me just so that. I say exactly what I can. Today, as the Rules Committee considers this massive budget reconciliation conference agreement, uh, we find ourselves in the midst of a budget crisis that has shut down lar large parts of the federal government. Uh, this crisis has the potential to hurt many ma innocent Americans. So I hope we will act quickly to get the federal government moving again. Unfor unfortunately, the positions of both sides in this debate have become so polarized that those involved are speaking past each other instead of to each other. Uh, this is not the atmosphere in which the Congress and the President can best solve this problem for the American people. 
I want to propose a new type of rule for this conference agreement. This rule will allow the bill's quick consideration and at the same time allow members in the American public to examine its, its contents in a calm atmosphere. Normally when the Rules Committee reports a rule for a conference report, there is a requirement that the legislation be laid over for three days to allow members in the public to study it before it is brought to the floor for a vote. And that fundamentally is good policy. However, for a variety of reasons, uh, the Rules Committee often waives this requirement. Uh, because the current situation demands that we act quickly, I will not object to the waiving of this rule today. Nevertheless, I still think it is important that members and the public have enough time to learn about the contents of this large bill. Therefore, I propose that two hours of floor time be set aside at the beginning of the debate be, to be set aside at the beginning of the debate for members who have not yet seen this legislation to ask questions about the thousands of provisions contained in it. I would ask that the chairman of the committees uh, involved in reconciliation be unavailable on the floor to answer members' questions about the important components of this bill. The time would be reserved for questions from the minority which has not yet has a chance to examine the bill. I might say, I guess that overstates that some of us have. It's been, mimeograph machines have been breaking down, and so some have seen it. You know, I have a, some piece of paper, files of paper in my hand here, which is sort of summary, but many members haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. When this question and answer session is complete, and members are better informed about the bill's contents, then we proceed to debate the bill. Uh, given the size of this legislation, two hours of constructive questions and answers is not unreasonable, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure that you recall in 1993, the Democratic majority allowed a full six hours of debate on the Reconciliation Conference Agreement. Certainly, the large scope of this legislation, with its many implications for millions of Americans, demands that we have no less time for a public discussion this year. Mr. Chairman, this type of rule would serve two purposes. First, it would get this bill to the floor without the required three-day layover, so we can move forward to quickly to get the federal government running again. It would also give members and the American public a better understanding of what the bill contains. Mr. Uh, <coughs> Martin, we appreciate uh, your testimony, and uh, I know Mr. Uh, Kasich uh, does have an appointment he has to go to, and uh, if the members on our side would uh, withhold the questions, and let me just ask uh, Mr. Bielensen if he has any questions of Mr. Kasich before he goes, uh, we'd be glad to recognize you, well, the two of you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to give him a compliment, although I'm not sure if uh, under the rule we just all voted for, almost all of us were allowed to do that anymore without <laughs> getting is a couple it, of Is it nom a nominal compliment? No, this is a really very big compliment, worth more than even the $10 we would have allowed earlier in the day. In all seriousness, I'd like to say to the chairman of the Budget Committee that I appreciate very, very much his, his kind words. And, and uh, I, have no, I know of no, no way to better express my, my feelings for him than to tell him that if, if there were more people around this place like himself and some of the chaps across the aisle with whom we have the pleasure of dealing on this particular committee, uh, I don't think I would have made that decision. But uh, I also want to tell you, John, that the last time you were here, I tried to compliment you, and you were being nice with me, too, and the other members here, and the, folk, the man from, I guess it was the, the Post, misunderstood, as usual. I mean, the press got it wrong, as usual, and they said something a little bit nasty about you, a little bit nasty about me, in the hopes that he's not here today, whoever he may have been. <laughs> I want to tell you again, I hope it comes out right this time. Well, he, he, I think he... Uh he, he was pointing out the facts that, that it was unusual that I was tired of listening to myself talk. So, I mean, he was accurate on that. <laughs> but you're right. No, Thank what you. are, you're welcome. But I was saying at the time, and I'd, I'd like to reiterate, if, if I might, that given the fact which we've had to come to accept over these past few months that you folks are in charge instead of us folks, there's nobody on your side that we on our side would prefer to have in your very important position than, than you, sir. And this whole process, which is difficult enough for all of us, and politically for many of us, particularly on our side, has made very much more 
palatable, if I may say so, and I, I need a stronger word than that, uh, having you there rather than, than who it, someone else. So mm -hmm. I, do want you to, I do want you to know that. Um, one of the good things about this bill, if I may say so, Mr. Chairman, is that finally all this talk from you folks over here about a balanced budget is relevant. It hasn't been the last few days on the last few bills. <laughs> Those were appropriations bills. They didn't have anything to do with the seven-year glide path. This does, and we will, you can say it as much as you want today, and we understand. You're finally, you finally got the right bill to talk about. <laughs> and right. uh, that's why, I'm, that's why that's, we that's wonder progress. why you're only giving yourselves a couple of hours tomorrow to talk about it. This is an historic <laughs> occasion, as our friend from Ohio suggests. And the only concerns we have, the only real concerns, are those really expressed by Mr. Sabo. This is a very big bill. We're concerned about the three-day, about waiving the three-day layover, which you all quite correctly used to criticize us about waiving when there were big bills to be taken up, you know, shortly on the floor. Uh, we're concerned, as, as Mr. Kasich said, this uh, about this historic debate tomorrow. There really won't be enough time for it. And in some respects, and in some to some extent, perhaps you'd you'd want more time to to crow about it. Although I guess the bill will be back, you know, it'll, I guess it'll be vetoed eventually. It'll come back, and we'll have, we'll have to work it out. So we can keep, we can keep talking about it. But, but Mr. Sabo made a very salient point, and that is, of course, that even those of us on this committee who had an opportunity to glance quickly at some of the materials don't really know exactly what's in there. And it would be very helpful if you didn't, you know, if, if not, if you don't want to give four hours or six hours of general debate, which may not be the best way of doing it. Mr. Sabo, I thought, had a pretty useful idea, which would be very helpful in educating all the members on both sides of the aisle prior to actually. Doing the, entering the, the general debate on the bill to give us some opportunity to find out more about what's in it. Mr. Kasich himself probably could, you know, could probably answer most of the questions. You may not, might not even have to have all of the committee chairman there, but some such proposal as Mr. Sabo made is not a bad idea at all, and perhaps you all can think about it you know, before we actually come up with a, a rule, because two hours on such a major bill uh, is really not adequate, if I may so suggest. So please think about <clears throat> what Mr. Sabo suggested. Mr. Frost. I really only have one question. I just want to confirm something that I was advised by staff. Um, I have looked through the side-by-side, -side, um, the uh, prepared by the uh, majority staffs of the House and Senate committees on the budget. I assume you, you've seen this, yes. uh, uh, Chairman Casey. I, I know it exists. But... Well, I looked, and there was something missing from this, totally missing. And so I asked uh, the question, was did it mean... Does this document mean that the medical malpractice caps have been dropped since there's no reference to them in this document at all? Yeah. And it's my understanding. I was advised by, by, uh, by staff that, in fact, the caps on medical malpractice no longer exist as a part of this conference report. That's correct. Hmm. We, were, uh, we were taken out by the bird rule. It, it, yes, well, it let was. me assure the gentleman we will win that battle before it's over. They are going to be in there. In, in some piece of legislation. Oh, I understand. I understand that the, there'll be a renewed effort at some point. I was only trying to confirm that, That's in fact, correct. they have been dropped from reconciliation. And if I may ask one other thing, because I, I didn't have time to check on this, uh, uh, my colleague from the state of Texas, Mr. Stockman, had a provision uh, relating to uh, home equity lending in Texas that was in the House version of reconciliation. What happened to that? Uh, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you on it. Did it survive the conference? I, mean, I, I don't know. We'll have to get back to you. Okay, because it, it is not, in, while this document is, is, is helpful, it's not exhausted. Yeah, and, we'll, we'll uh, get you an answer on that, Mr. Frost. I, I think it's very important that the, uh, that the House knows what's in this and what is not in this. And to the extent that uh, uh, I would only echo what Mr. Uh, Bielenson said, that uh, it would be of help to the House in a constructive way if there were a sufficient amount of uh, debate time so that points like this could be explored. Uh, this is such a monumental matter, uh, a vote of such great consequence that I think it is very important that the House be fully informed uh, before the votes are cast. Very good point. Thank you, Mr. Frost. Uh, uh, John, we're, we're going to excuse you. Uh, uh, Tony, you came in late, but uh, uh, John has does have an appointment he must keep. And uh, we had... Uh, yielded our uh, time to so that Mr. Bielenson and Mr. Frost could ask questions. John, again, we deeply appreciate you coming, and uh, we'll see you on the floor tomorrow. Um, are there questions from this side of the aisle? If not, uh, Mr. Bielenson or Mr. Ho uh, Frost, Mr. Hall, do you have any questions? No questions right now, Mr. Chairman. 
Okay. If not, then Marty, will you? Mr. Chairman, I would, I'd like to make a statement. I think that, that uh, John Kasich's uh, dedication is unexcelled. He does an excellent job, and so, uh, Martin, so is yours. Thank you. Glad you're here. But I'd like to say for the benefit of the chairman well, of this committee. I want committee, these people here on time. I don't and like his this. work in the uh, dairy problem that he's utter dedicated. <laughs> if there are no further questions of Mr. Sabo, Marty, uh, we all know Thank that you. you are one of the most sincere, dedicated members of this body, and we appreciate the uh, fine actually, work you do as well. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I was limiting my questions to Mr. Casey because I knew he had to leave. Uh, I would have a couple of questions for Mr. Sabo. Well, then you are recognized, sir. And I don't mean to try and take time no. away from the other side. Um, Marty, I don't know if you have... Uh, have testified because I came in a little bit late uh, to any degree on some of the things, some of the more controversial matters that uh, have been preserved in this conference report. I don't know if you had it, the opportunity to go into those. I, I have a series of papers I've just received. I'm, well, I would, and, and again, if you want I to. I may or may not know. Well, if you want to refer to or uh, ask staff about this, but uh, it's my understanding that the. Uh, provisions relating to uh, uh, corporations' ability to uh, Marty, borrow from Marty, pension the, funds. The, the young lady cannot hear what's going on with it, the noise in the room. It's my understanding that the provision relating to a corporation's ability to borrow from its, a corporation's ability to borrow from its pension fund uh, it still is in this. The, uh, the basic provision is passed by the House. Is that correct? Uh, my understanding uh, that the, the ability to uh, borrow from the pension funds is still in the bill, somewhat modified from the House version. In what exact form that is, I frankly don't know. That's the kind of question I think should be answered in a, a question and answer session on the House floor. And it's, also it's still there. It's modified in what form, I don't know. It's also my understanding that uh, uh, the conference report substantially reduces uh, tax liability uh, under the corporate alternative minimum tax. That is my understanding. Uh, again, a matter of, uh, of some controversy. That is accurate. And um, it's also my understanding that the, uh, uh, in the Medicaid sections that the, uh, it, it eliminates the guarantee of nursing home care uh, for seniors who have exhausted all of their assets. I believe that's the case. Mr. Chairman, I would put it this way, Mr. Frost, I can think of no reason for anyone who voted no earlier to change their vote. Well, th these are matters of, of real consequence and matters of, uh, that I hope will be explored on the floor because they're matters that uh, directly affect people. Uh, our constituents, uh, your constituents, uh, the public at large. Um, and, and there's a particularly controversial question because of some comments by the speaker during the closing debate on the Medicaid bill, as you may recall. Uh, there was a question about uh, the guarantee of help with Medicare premiums for low-income seniors uh, under Medicaid. And uh, the speaker represented that in fact this was still guaranteed for uh, seniors and Mr. Markey, I believe it was, who came and testified before our committee uh, who said that that was not the case, that it was optional with the states and that it's my understanding that that is in fact what, uh, what was uh, preserved, that it's not low-income seniors are not guaranteed that their Medicare premiums will be paid under Medicaid, but it's optional. Uh, oh, oh, oh. I am not sure what they put in the conference report again. I can tell you what was in the bill as it passed the House, mm -hmm. and that did not represent funding uh, to maintain. Uh, th there are several parts to that. For the, uh, for the senior under poverty, current law provides for both the Medicare premium and the payment of the co-payments and deductibles. Uh, the funding in that bill, there was a 90 percent set aside from, uh, I th forget which year, of simply of the premium. So there would not have been a set aside to cover the increasing premiums for uh, an increasing number of adults plus the copay and, and deductions. That clearly would have been substantially uh, uh, changed. There is also for those uh, uh, with income slightly above the poverty line, a, uh, a, uh, 
the Medicaid premiums, but not copayments and deductibles are are covered. Again, uh, that group would not have been covered under the Medicaid legislation uh, that passed the House. Uh, the combination of what passed the House was uh, significantly higher premiums under Part B of Medicare for millions of low-income elderly and significantly reduced funding to the states uh, to do what uh, is done under current law, paying uh, premiums and co-pays uh, for the lower income seniors under the poverty line and the, the premium for those slightly above the poverty line. So it was significant changes in the resources available for that level of income in two fashions. One, a very significant premium increase and secondly, a reduction in the uh, benefits under the Medicaid program. And, and one of the other one of the other very controversial matters in the legislation as it worked its way through the House and the Senate uh, dealt with student loans, college student loans. And as, uh, as I understand it, the conference uh, report uh, cuts the student loan program by $5 billion. That is my understanding exactly how they do it. Uh, I have not had time to discover yet. With gentleman yield? Yes. Is that a cut from current numbers or a cut from previously projected rates of growth? Well, I would have to defer to uh, Mr. Sabo, who's on the committee, but uh, it's been uh, certainly discussed in terms by virtually everyone in the numbers terms of that the $5 billion dollar cut of student loans. The numbers I've seen show the student loan program going up and the numbers of loans going up, and I'm curious to know whether you're, proposing, you're, you're suggesting a cut from current spending or a cut from projected, previously projected rates of growth. I would assume there would be cuts from uh, students eligible. To, uh, I expect if there's an increasing number of students and an increasing number of people in this country with lower incomes, there would be an increasing uh, number of people eligible for the student loans. I guess what you're telling me is you don't know. But what's in the conference report? No, I don't know. That, on, that, yeah. only, that only underscores my earlier point, that uh, there needs to be adequate time so that these matters can be fully explored on the, on the House floor. I mean, this is a monumental piece of legislation dealing with a wide range of subjects, uh, which has just been uh, made available uh, today and which will be voted on tomorrow. Um, and uh, you're really asking, uh, uh, by rushing it to the floor uh, with only 24 hours, you're asking the House to accept a lot of things on faith. And uh, I think that uh, a number of these points need to be clarified. Your side needs to have the opportunity on the floor to fully explain and to answer questions. And our side needs the opportunity to ask those questions. Uh, I, just, uh, I just think that this is, uh, uh, I would agree with uh, some of the comments earlier that this certainly is, uh, if not the most important thing that Congress has voted on in a long time, certainly one of the most important things that we've voted on in a very long time. And uh, our constituents uh, expect us to understand what we're voting on. Um, I assume that uh, most people on your side of the aisle uh, will vote for it. Um, however, uh, there may even be some members on your side of the aisle who will have very legitimate questions uh, about these provisions. And uh, it may affect uh, their decision to ultimately vote for it. I know that you're interested, your side of the aisle is interested in attracting some Democratic votes. And to the extent that you're able to, the extent that you can attract Democratic votes will depend largely on the answers to some very tough questions uh, that members on my side of the aisle who, are, who want to be constructive and are interested in being helpful and may, may seriously consider voting for this bill, but they'll want to have their questions answered. And uh, I don't know how, Mr. Chairman, that we can, uh, we can really do this, this, this bill justice tomorrow. Um, I would... Uh, uh, there have been some discussions, uh, in, as you know, in the last few hours about uh, the House uh, staying in session through the weekend. The majority leader has indicated that we will stay in session Saturday. Uh, he even indicated in his floor exchange with, the, uh, with uh, the Democratic leader, Mr. Gebhardt, that perhaps this bill would be considered on Saturday in addition to being considered on Friday. And I think that's not a bad idea. I mean, if, it ta if, if we need parts of two days to consider this legislation so that everyone understands what's in it, let's do that. I mean, we're here. We've, uh, we're not going any, any place uh, right away. We might as well uh, have a full understanding of what we're voting on. And uh, um, I know that we have another rule that we're going to be considering shortly on the issue of uh, Bosnia, a very important issue. Um, 
I would hope that uh, we would not rush our way through this uh, reconciliation bill simply because we have to get to a vote on Bosnia. I have no problems in voting on Bosnia, but I think that it should uh, get in line, quite frankly, uh, and not be, uh, we shouldn't be pressured to, uh, uh, to handle this bill in a very quick way uh, because uh, we're concerned about being able to also vote on Bosnia. Th those are the only comments mm -hmm. I have. Are there further questions of the, uh, of the witness? Mr. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Martin, can you, can you uh, enlighten us about nursing home regulations? What did they do in this bill? My understanding is that uh, the provisions more similar to the Senate bill uh, are in the bill, but I can't give you a specific uh, answer. I think, let me find it. Which not have, I think it might be in half. Yeah. <laughs> My understanding is that. Uh, let me find. Uh, My understanding is most of the current federal law, uh, most of the current uh, federal law standards for nursing homes are retained in the conference report is my understanding, which would be a significant improvement from the, the uh, uh, original House bill. However, um, one provision that still is in here is, uh, as I understand it, uh, putting liens on, uh, on an elderly person's property, which has been prohibited for some time is permitted on this conference agreement, which I think is unfortunate. I think, however, from what I understand, the nursing home regulation part has been very substantially improved from uh, when it left the House. There was some confusion over the uh, school lunch program. Uh, there, there were some diff major differences, of course, between the House and the Senate. Do you know if they block grant school lunch programs? No, I don't. I read in the paper today that uh, two of the competing chairmen were quarreling yet today over what was or wasn't in the bill. So who is accurate? I don't know. As I understand, uh, uh, Representative Goodling had one interpretation, and uh, Senator Luger had another, and I'm not sure which is accurate. Has anybody, does anybody, uh, has anybody read this bill? Uh, I don't think anybody's read this one. <laughs> No, that just became available oh, I'm sure late they today. Have. And, oh, well, I'm sure. And uh, there, there are a host of people trying to read it and trying to prepare summaries mm -hmm. that uh, people are trying to do within the best of their ability. Uh, hopefully by tomorrow we have somewhat better information. But uh, Representative Hall, that's why I suggested that we have two hours of question and answer where members of the minority might ask uh, the members of the majority who's involved in putting this together, not only on Medicaid and Medicare, but on important other areas like the Farm Bill, where there's, I understand, a major rewrite of Farm Bill, uh, that members could ask questions. And I would hope they would not be rhetorical questions, but factual questions. Uh, the, I, you know, the reality is we'll get to the rhetoric, and. Uh, I expect uh, they will be the same speeches that have been given several times before as we've considered this bill on both sides of the aisle. And, uh, <coughs> and we could probably play the tape recordings, and uh, that would uh, suffice. Yeah, but uh, And uh, I, I just think it would be useful on something of this, this magnitude to have some period of time, just simple non-rhetorical questions, uh, factual, of what is or isn't in the bill, and non-rhetorical, but rather simply factual answers to what's in it. I think that would be useful. It uh, might calm some of the jumpy nerves that seem to exist on both sides of the aisle at times around this institution. If Do that, and then get on to the rhetoric and let if, people give uh, the same speeches for the third time on the bill. If Mr. Hall would yield. Uh, let me just say that, um, you know, I came out of the private sector, and when we would have our meetings and our debates among our boards of directors, of which I served on, on many, 
uh, there wasn't any rhetoric involved. Uh, we'd have question and answers, and uh, we'd get down to brass tacks. And uh, that's the way the debates ought to go on the floor of Congress. And never mind all this rhetorical baloney. Uh, if we put out two hours of debate here, we ought to spend two hours asking each other questions. Now, as far as who's read this bill and who hasn't read it, um, I can tell you that I've read the dairy section uh, 47 times. We know that. And uh, I know exactly what's in my, my Minnesota farmers <laughs> wish that uh, you had not read the, the dairy part but, of it, uh, Mr. Chairman. But my point is that there are, there are conferees, um, many, many conferees, that have read those sections. They know exactly what is in here. The, the press has reported exactly what is in here because they have come out of these meetings and they have uh, 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 most all of the questions that have been asked, like on the nursing homes, I, I've read about in the paper, that uh, they have been answered by the, uh, by the conferees. But be that as it may, uh, I think it's an excellent idea that, we, uh, that when we go on the floor with the debate, whether it's one, two, or three hours, uh, that we, uh, we request the members not to uh, have one minute of, of, of rhetorical statements uh, by each member. And let's just have you and Mr. Casey go at it for a couple of hours and answer each other's questions. Uh, I think that would be invaluable to the membership, and I'm going to suggest it. Well, I think Chairman, somebody I would... needs to read the bill first before they start asking pardon? the questions. I mean, you know, we're talking about essentially running the government by, here. By tomorrow or Saturday, I would think that, uh, that you would have members uh, on your side of the aisle that would have read their sections of the bill and be prepared to to ask questions and uh, certainly we'd be prepared to answer those questions. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I would suggest that's not possible in a two-hour time limit. The, I think the reality is well, you're never going to abolish all the rhetoric and uh, some well, of that has to occur. What well, I'm Martin, suggesting, <clears throat> you take a couple hours for this kind of approach and then let the speechmakers well, go for a well, limited period of time. Martin, I'm going to tell you something. We could give 17 hours of debate. We could give three weeks of debate and you would never be able to answer the individual uh, specific questions on each line and item no, no, of the bill. No, 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 what the members are interested in is generally what's in it section by section. And that's what we really need to know. Yeah, what's in the agricultural section, right. what's in the welfare section, and right. those are the questions that can be answered. I yeah, think, yeah I'm not ways. looking at minutia, but, right. you know, a, a very important question is how the capitation grant to, to, in Medicare that's works. Right. And uh, I frankly read a summary, and I still don't understand it. Right. I don't read the, uh, that kind of description in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. Uh, how the Medicaid distribution formula works. I don't read that in the newspaper. You know, I, all of a sudden, I, I, somebody took f some money away from here to accommodate somebody. I still don't know anything. And it's going to be subject to interpretation. Yeah, uh, but because some basic you're... understanding of those kind of issues, some time for people to ask questions. Uh, I am sure there are a whole host of questions our members would have of your members on the Farm Bill. And uh, those should be legitimate questions period of time removed uh, you know do that and, and then people can give their speeches pro or con for a period of time also I just think it would be very useful to have that type of uh, format uh, for looking at a bill of this magnitude if it's uh, I hear rumors only two hours for debate I think that really does disservice uh, both to the majority and minority in terms of the magnitude of this bill are there further questions of Mr. the witness? chairman Mr. I think well, we just spent about three hours deciding whether we should get T-shirts from lobbyists. I think we should have more than three hours of debate on a bill like this. Mr. Chairman? Well, perhaps if we hadn't spent three hours on whether we get T-shirts from lobbyists, we'd have more time to consider this. Mr. Bielinson. But it was your side that screwed up the T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> it was? <laughs> Mr. Bielinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just three very brief matters. One, with respect to nursing home standards, I think the answer is that they maintain federal standards, but they're to be enforced. They are to be enforced at the state level, which is not terribly great, but nonetheless, they are retaining federal standards. Secondly, something which I can't at all, and perhaps others can't, it cannot either from what's before us, what's being done with welfare? Is that some of the welfare provisions are in here, but, but we were also, we also were led to understand that the welfare reform act, so-called, will be, will be taken out of this and, and will be before us as a separate matter sometime in the near future. Does the chairman happen to know the answer to that or yes, either the, right, chairman? The, gen the gentleman is correct and, um, and we'll be prepared to discuss that with you tomorrow morning. Okay, so it's, it's not, the whole welfare reform will not be found in here? Right now. Yes. Okay. It's in there. It's in there. It is in there. The totality of it is in there. Anyway, that's, that obviously, 
Anyway, Mr. Chairman, obviously that's a yeah. big question which we don't seem to quite have right. answer to and which we'd like to have. And finally, just to re reiterate, and you'll hear this several times from us, but, mm -hmm. but we do urge you to seriously consider granting some additional time for discussion mm -hmm. on the bill. Whether it takes two hours, three, four, or five hours, whenever you all take it up, tomorrow or the next day, whenever, you'll get it passed that day. <coughs> and I just think you'll do a better job for all of us and for the many right. folks who, for some reason, watch us on television. Uh, we'll all understand a great deal better what we're voting on if you give us some additional time. Thanks. If the gentleman would uh, smile a little bit, we might take his uh, request into consideration. I'm looking at a lovely, accept, I'm you. looking at a lovely woman out in the audience, and she's been smiling for the last <laughs> 45 minutes. She happens to be your wife. She has the most lovely smile, and uh, you've got a smile more, Tony, <laughs> like she does. Give us an extra hour. We'll give you an extra <laughs> smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost, um, we, we, we have... Since you, you brought up the subject, I, I, do, I am curious because I, I haven't agreed with your views, but it's, it's unclear to me exactly what happened. Um, yep. uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the summary that we were given uh, says that uh, all the dairy reforms have been removed from the conference agreement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, me, the, the summary that we've been given says that all dairy reforms uh, have been removed from the conference agreement. Is, is that you, since you, this is a thing that you're interested in, and I'm personally interested mm -hmm. in also, is that your understanding of what happened? The dairy issue was taken out of, of uh, reconciliation entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, there were proposals uh, from all sides. Uh, uh, those of us uh, east of the Mississippi in particular, but from th those of us that represent small dairy farmers all over the United States, people like Joe Skeen out of New Mexico, others in Idaho and all over the country. In Texas. Uh, in Texas, uh, had offered to, uh, to uh, completely abolish <coughs> milk price supports subsidies. In other words, for liquid milk, for butter, for powder, for cheese, uh, so that you take the government out of subsidizing the dairy industry in America. We had offered that. Uh, we did insist that, uh, that we continue with milk marketing waters, which simply uh, provides for price stabilization uh, all across the country in the 34 regions. So since we could not come to an agreement, uh, the issue was taken completely out of the budget and uh, will not uh, be, be uh, a part of it. Will that be dealt with in a, in a subsequent piece of legislation? Could be dealt with in a, uh, in a farm bill at some future time, and, and, and no doubt it will be. Well, Chairman Yield, is, isn't it a fact that the the reconciliation bill last year had a provision in it that if any authorizations were not renewed this year, we would be under last year's rules. And for the next two years, this, the, uh, all the farm supports would be under last year's rules. So we are continuing under that without an authorization. Through, through December 31st of 1996. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Answer the gentleman's question. Are there further uh, questions of the uh, witness? If not, uh, Martin, again, uh, accolades to you for the good work that you do, even though we don't agree all the time, and uh, thank you for coming. And thank you, the, and thank you for your courtesy. The next witness uh, uh, is the, uh, the late Sam Gibbons. Uh, and, uh, and I say that, uh, I mean the tardy Sam Gibbons, who was late in getting here. But uh, Sam, uh, you're another member, uh, uh, have the acquaintance of your lovely wife as well, and uh, uh, she is, you are so lucky to have a wife like she is. I don't know if she's lucky to have a husband like you. But same thing for my wife. <laughs> Push your button. There. Uh -huh. Ford and Martha's put up with me for 49 and a half years. Uh, well, she is a delightful Solomon, person. And I thank you. I agree with you. That's the <laughs> best deal I ever worked out in my life. <laughs> Mr. Solomon, I'll be brief and I'll leave the editorial stuff out. Uh, We've got a real problem here. You see that big bill. That's the biggest bill I've ever seen in 45 years of making law. And uh, frankly, that's the first time I've ever seen it. I, I was a conferee, but you know we were excluded from all conferences. And uh, that's unfortunately the way the system worked. With a very diminished staff and with a most of the Treasury employees on furlough, we're trying to analyze that bill. It's an almost impossible, it is an impossible task, frankly. You know, I have one tax expert 
that I've been allowed to keep. I have one Medicare expert that I've been allowed to keep. And I have about a half of a welfare expert that I've been allowed to keep. Now, well, Are these congressional employees? These are congressional employees. That you've been allowed to keep? Yes, sir. We've been, the, the budgets of all committees have been reduced drastically, and I am losing my one Medicare expert uh, because I can't pay him enough to keep him on the job. He is leaving the first of the year for a much better paying job in the state of New York, uh, I might say. So uh, we, we've got a real problem in analyzing all that. Now, the figures are these. In the tax area, there's $245 billion worth of tax changes in that right there. In Medicare, there are $280 billion worth of changes in there. In welfare, there are, 200, there are $82 billion worth of changes there from the federal level and about another 30 or $40 billion from the state level because what we do here affects how the states have to contribute to welfare. So, you know, we're talking about in all of this three quarter of a trillion dollars, most of it is for better or for worse in the area that Mr. Archer and I have to work in. And I frankly have never seen the bill and my limited staff is working on it as fast as they can. We would like to be able to conduct an intelligent debate. Uh, please give us enough time. That's your decision to make that. Uh, we're going to be here all weekend and maybe shortly into next week anyway. And we would like to do a, a, a workmanlike job on it. We think that not only do the members of Congress, but the American public want a workmanlike job on something that's as big and as important as that. So that's, that's all that I have to say, and I'll be glad to answer any questions if there are any. Well, Sam, I just want to uh, tell you that uh, members from both sides here have, uh, have the greatest respect for you, uh, you and uh, your uh, capacity on the Ways and Means Committee all these years. Uh, you've certainly uh, uh, been a great congressman, and we, Thank you. We, we admire you and respect you for it. Are there any questions of uh, Mr. Gibbons? Questions? Uh, um, I, have a quest I have a question. Um, Mr. Gibbons, um, I heard some discussion earlier this evening um, related to the question of the tax provisions that were in the 1993 reconciliation bill, the provisions that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle criticized roundly, the uh, tax increases in 1993. It's my understanding that none of those tax increases that the Republicans criticized so roundly are repealed in this legislation that has now been produced by the Republican majority. Is that correct? That's my understanding, but don't hold me to that, please, because I have not had the opportunity to read that bill. Uh, but I am told from, from the statements that have been put out on it, not from actually examination of it, that, that you're correct, that none of the provisions for which we were so roundly criticized uh, in the last election are, in, are repealed in this bill. I find that curious since they made such a big deal out of how terrible those provisions were and now that they're in the majority they had the chance to roll those back or change them but they didn't do that. Well, anytime you change that tax law you've got to, you're talking about real money and you've got to, under the rules we operate on, you've got to put the burden on somebody else and I guess they looked around and said you know, I don't have any friends that want to pick up that burden. Uh, okay. That's, I guess, what happened to them. Okay. I have no other question. If I could, uh, Martin, just uh, again, uh, it's been reported in the press and the uh, that uh, you know the vast uh, amount of the uh, of the 245 billion dollars is made up of a 500 dollar tax credit that still remains in the bill. Uh, I think the uh, I think the uh, salary levels were lowered, well, 110,000 per couple and 75,000 for a single person. But um, uh, if there weren't other repeals of many taxes uh, that I want uh, in the 93 bill and others, uh, we we there's no room to fit it in unless we raise that 245 billion, and then people would complain about that. So uh, we 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 did it by priority. Well, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to editorialize on. 
to on the five hundred dollar per child tax cut but as i understand it thirty three percent of all the children in the united states who are in families don't get anything out of it. The, the families don't get anything out of it thirty three percent that's about well, I, I can't tell you it's it's a lot of millions of children and families I've forgotten the exact figures. Mr. Forty three percent of all the children in families get a diminished amount and only those in the middle and upper income levels get the full five hundred. Mm -hmm. The five hundred begins to phase out uh, for a family of Sam. at around uh, Chairman Yield, a hundred thousand. Isn't it? Isn't it true that there are nine million families that will benefit? Six million of which are in families that make a hundred thousand dollars a year and less. You say nine million? I, I, I nine million. That figure, but I'm not. I, I'm not. A, nine million families will benefit from this provision. Six million of those families are families that make a hundred thousand dollars a year and less. Two thirds. There are. I have all those figures, and I can't argue with you about it, and I won't argue with you about it. I do know that 33% of all the children of, of the qualifying age and in families with working parents will not get a penny out of this. One red penny. And then there are about 10% more who get a diminished amount, less than $500. So it... Uh, I, I'm sorry I didn't bring all those figures with me, but I know that's the truth. Mr. Chairman, I, I, was, of course, I was asking about the provisions in the 93 bill mm -hmm. that, that were so roundly criticized. Mm -hmm. And specifically, uh, one of the ones that, uh, that you all criticized, and, and I think mm -hmm. an effort was made to change, but apparently was dropped somewhere in the, on, along mm -hmm. the way, dealt with the uh, Social Security taxes. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that people, uh, an additional amount of, uh, of, uh, of income, uh, earned by senior citizens was subject to tax. I think it went from 50 percent, uh, if, they, if they pass a certain threshold, fi uh, from 50 percent up to 85 percent. Uh, why was that tax. put in anyway? That, why, was, why wasn't that repealed if it was so no, terrible? Why was that, it was put my, in? that was my question to you, that uh, that was put well, in I 83 in, 80, in 1993, and you all said it was terrible. You had the chance to repeal it, and you didn't repeal it in this bill. <laughs> what the gentleman every, every now and then our Republican friends do something right. Well, no, no, I, I, I'm just curious if it was so terrible. But why didn't you repeal okay. that in well, this what, bill? Okay. What the gentleman yells? Mr. Goss is recognized. Thank you. I, I, I am really pleased to hear this newfound interest in we'll repealing taxes. Uh, and I, uh, that is encouraging, perhaps the most encouraging thing I've heard in another Well, I'm just trying to, to make you day. honest. But, yeah. but uh, <laughs> would the gentleman say that those of us who are making sure the effort to continue repealing that tax on senior citizens goes forward, would you join us? Absolutely. Thank I you. think I it should be repealed. I want to know why you didn't do it. All right. I, I want to know why when you have you the votes. I hope you all are successful because it means about, uh, uh, oh, about... Five hundred dollars to Martha and me. Uh, yeah. So it, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to my, be greedy. My question, here. which is, that, <laughs> which I have that figure. Yes, yeah, sir. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, if I could continue, okay. my question is a serious one. Uh, members on your side of the aisle railed against that, said it was terrible. You have the votes to do anything you want to, and you didn't change it. I don't understand what happened. Why, would, Sam? Do you know why that was dropped out? Why they didn't change that? It raises a lot of money, and the whole this whole battle is over money. And you know, if you raise, if you give somebody back money, you got to take it from somebody else. And they couldn't find that volunteer that wanted to give it up. That's, I, I guess, if, the I, uh, if the gentleman here, gentlemen, I think we have to uh, move on here. But uh, if I might just uh, say to my good friend Mr. Frost and Mr. Gibbons, as long as the Republican majority is the Republican majority, there will be every attempt every year to cut taxes and put the money back into the pockets of people. And uh, I can assure you that's going to be one of my top priorities. Well, I hope you all are successful. I just want you all to do what you say you're going to do. That's all. Well, I, you know, we, uh, I, I promise not to editorialize. <laughs> I promise not to editorialize. And I, I, I hope that you'll forgive me for this breach of that promise. We're not, it's, this whole thing is not a question about when or whether. It's a question of how. Who is going to pay 
either in cuts of benefits or increased taxes for the process of balancing the budget. And, and that's all the debate's about. All of us recognize that the budget's got to be balanced. All of us recognize that we'd like to do it as soon as possible. What we're really arguing over is whose benefits are going to get cut and whose taxes are going to get increased. And that's the area that I work in. If we can move on, we have another very lengthy sure. hearing that's uh, coming up. Well, if there are no further questions. Give us as much time questions. as you can. We, we, you know, we'll try not to waste it. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> thank you. Good, Sam. Thank you so much for coming. That concludes the, uh, the hearing on the, um, the uh, Balanced Budget Act. And um, if you would pass out the, uh, the proposed rule. So that we can begin to repair the report uh, uh, that will not hold us up on the floor since there are no further votes. Uh, I think we ought to act on this rule before we start the hearing on the, uh, uh, on the Bosnia situation, which might take some time. And it will save all of our staffs on both sides some time of staying here till midnight tonight. Uh, the uh, chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule that vacates the proceedings by which the conference report on H.R. 2491, the seven-year balanced budget act, was filed, authorizes the managers to immediately refile the report in the form of actually signed and ordered reported with the corrected part printed in section three of the rule. The rule further provides that the existing signatures of the conferee shall remain valid as authorizing the pre presentation of the conference report to the House in its corrected form. The rule then provides for the consideration of the newly filed conference report to accompany H.R. 2491. The rule waives all points of order against the conference report and against its consideration. The rule provides for two areas of debate equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the budget committee. The rule provides for one motion to recommit the conference report, which may not contain instructions. Finally, the rule provides the following disposition of the conference report. No further action on the bill is in order except by subsequent order of the House. <coughs> You've heard the motion by the gentleman from Tennessee. Um, is there any uh, discussion or amendment to the motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman. I, I have a question, if I may, before we offer. Mr. Uh, Frost. Uh, the point six on your explanation of the rule says it provides one motion to recommit which may not contain instructions. You're, you're denying us the opportunity to offer a motion to recommit with instructions. Is that correct? Yes, uh, it's language that was taken from uh, your rule last year in the, uh, in the 103rd Congress, which uh, listed as item four, provides one motion to recommit, which may not contain instructions. And we just uh, carried the, the which, 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 which uh, I understand you, if I recall, you objected to strenuously. I don't seem to recall that, but I probably did. <laughs> I seem to recall that. <laughs> And I can understand your objection to it, too. Mr. Chairman. Any further discussion? Yes. Mr. Bielanson. First of all, we'd like to say that if you keep making the same mistakes we made in the past, what happened to us may happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> but secondly, well, I, I hope it takes us 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> Not at the I, rate you're going. <laughs> I have an amendment, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bielanson. <laughs> I move that the committee amend the rule by adding two hours of additional debate, which would be used as a time for members to question the House conferees on the recon reconciliation bill or balanced budget bill, as you prefer, uh, as to the contents of the legislation. We do have a big bill before us, about 3,000 pages uh, long. It was filed late last night. Many of our participating members have not had a chance, as Mr. Gibbons uh, said quite clearly, almost poignantly, I think, that um, to, to, to read it and to figure out exactly what's in it. 
Uh, this is the suggestion basically following, this is basically follows up on, on Mr. Sabo's suggestion uh, to give us some additional time to members from both parties and to the public to find out what's in here. As we suggested earlier, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think people would appreciate this. This is a major proposal, quite obviously, of which you all are quite proud. Uh, and in all seriousness, uh, you ought to have some, some more opportunity than you're giving yourself. Only one of the two hours would be allotted to, your, to the majority party to, to talk about what you, what you propose uh, to do. And as we suggested earlier also, and finally, Mr. Chairman, whether you take this bill up tomorrow or the next day and then give it either two hours as your suggestion or four hours or perhaps a little bit more as we're suggesting, you'll complete the bill and you'll, and you'll pass the bill that, that very day. It just seems to us that uh, there's every, everything to be gained and nothing to be lost by giving it a modest amount of additional time, and we, we'd urge you to support this General suggestion. Neal. Of course. I, I agree with the gentleman in California. It looks like that the getaway time has already been broached, that we're not going to get away tonight or tomorrow or the next day or the next day. So I don't see how two additional hours is going to hurt anything. It's the most important bill we've got going through the Congress. I think there are many unanswered questions today, though even the, some of the questions back and forth <coughs> this evening weren't adequately answered. And I think that to allow two hours of question and answer would, uh, would do uh, the members of Congress and the American public a great, uh, great service, Mr. Chairman. I think that uh, since you're so innovative in your rules and you want to improve upon what the last uh, Congress did, I think this would be a good step in the right direction for you to uh, award the two additional hours for uh, the purpose of question and answer. The gentleman yield. I yield. Who has the time? the time? Mr. Bielinson has the time. Does the gentleman yield? I yield, yield to anybody. Let me, let me just say that um, uh, I am going to vote for the two hours additional time. This is the reason I came to Congress, to have a thorough debate and balance the budget for my grandchildren. And I think uh, shortening it to two hours is, is too little. This is, the national, this is the national goal, and I will vote with your amendment. We thank you, sir, for your help. Well, I would, uh, I really would have to op <clears throat> oppose the amendment, uh, Tony. It, um, uh, you know, this, this debate has been going on for weeks and weeks now. And the, uh, uh, generally, uh, we know what's in the bill. I think that uh, two hours uh, tomorrow uh, will enlighten all of us uh, to the point that, uh, that we can be enlightened. We are never going to know what the specifics are in a 3,000-page bill. There's no way that we can do it. And you can stay here for eight or 10 hours or uh, even longer. Uh, I'll just tell you from the members from both sides of the aisle that have approached me on the floor today, there are many of them, like myself, that haven't been home for three weeks. And we have worked every single weekend, including last weekend, uh, uh, Saturday, Sunday, uh, Sunday night until 1 o'clock in the morning. And uh, not that uh, that means that we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't stay here and do our work. But uh, we have a very, very important bill coming up on the floor dealing with Bosnia, which deals with uh, whether or not we're going to put 25,000 American soldiers uh, in harm's way. Uh, uh, we only have a window of opportunity tomorrow for two hours uh, if we take it up tomorrow. Now, if we stay uh, uh, into Saturday and uh, into Sunday, uh, certainly by unanimous consent, uh, the time can be extended. But uh, as of this evening, uh, I would hope that we would be able to defeat your amendment, but we would take it under consideration. Uh, and if the majority leader feels that there is time, uh, on the floor to extend the debate. Why, I'm sure we can do that by unanimous consent. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman. May, may I be heard on this? Well, first um, of all, Mr. Bielinson has the yeah. time. Thanks. With, with, re with, res to. with respect, we understand what you're saying and, and, and certainly agree in part, but we're not asking an awful lot. And it is a major bill. And the problem, is, as the gentleman saw, as the ladies and gentlemen saw, is that even our, our two best informed members are not sure of some of the major provisions of the bill. Yeah. Uh, and it would be very useful in every respect, as we argued just before, and I shan't continue, uh, to take a couple hours out just to, just to allow members to find out, somebody who would make inquiries as to what's in there. I think by tomorrow or the next day, whenever you all do take it up, uh, they'll be in a position to answer those questions. It'll be very helpful to all of us. And, and in a sense, then, you'll only have two hours of debate on the bill itself, but you could have two hours set aside mainly, I hope, we hope not to arguments, but to, but to inquiries as to, as to what's included in it. It's an awfully, sure. I thank my friend for yielding. And the, the concern I think that many members have, they ask 
the majority leader to outline the proposed schedule for the coming days. And he outlined that on the House floor. And members are already making plans based on that. Now, that decision was made in large part due to the fact that we were going to have two hours, a two-hour package on an issue which has, as Mr. Solomon said, been debated for a long period of time. So I think that, that uh, the plans that members have made over the next few days obviously are flexible, but I think the goal of bringing this to the floor and considering it for two hours uh, is certainly more than adequate as we look at the debate as it's been raging on for a long period of time. Would Mr. Billington yield? Yeah, except I will, but all I can say is it's not a very strong argument. And, yeah. and you, you folks argued last year and the years right. passed quite correctly, and we often You're acceded right. to your request, at least partially, on truly major pieces of legislation which are, in a sense, newly sprung upon us. We don't know what's in it to give some additional time. And, I mean, uh, your arguments are not awfully good, David, if I may say so. And I believe we're going to be in session till 6 or so on Saturday anyway. Mm -hmm. And it just seems to me that on your most major piece of legislation, which you're also terribly proud of, we ought to have more than two hours to talk about it. And I don't know what else I can say about it. If well, the gentleman um, would we you recognize sure. Mr. Frost, yes. and then I would like to sum up and uh, move the amendment. Go ahead. Well, a little while ago, you handed out the rule from uh, last year, from 1993, that you were so proud of. Mm -hmm. And that rule has six hours of general debate in it. Mm -hmm. now, I don't understand if six hours of general debate was the right thing to do in 1993, why is, why is two hours the right thing to do in 1995, given the monumental nature of this piece of legislation? Gentleman Neal? Yes. And also, you said that you copied it from us. If you want to copy, copy the whole bill. Just don't copy the I don't want to copy that much. Just want to yeah. The good parts. Yeah. So if you want to, I think that's true. And, and our bill last year wasn't anywhere as complicated as this. We gave six hours. No, there were a lot more spending in it. Well, the, yeah, but it's, it wasn't mo more paper in it. I think we'd like to know what's in it, and, and as Mr. Billinson said, two of the most informed people on the bill disagree what's in the bill. So if they disagree, what does a common well, member of Congress feel about it? Let me, let me just say, and, and then we can wrap this up, that uh, the original uh, rule that uh, we had uh, laid on the table here this, uh, this afternoon uh, called for one hour of general debate. Uh, we had taken that up with the minority leader, uh, Mr. Gephardt, and uh, naturally, he was opposed to the one hour. And uh, uh, begrudgingly, uh, he understands that there's only going to be two hours. So uh, it's not that we didn't discuss and uh, negotiate the amount of time. We did. We still have that window that we have to uh, abide by. And I would hope that uh, we can now move the gentleman's amendment. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Moakley. I don't think the American public is going to understand how we can spend all that time on whether a T-shirt is in a bill or a cap in the bill and spend two hours on every dollar that's going to be spent by the United States government. When the American people find out that we are not going to increase the, the accumulated national debt in this country from $5 trillion to $6 trillion, believe me, they are going to be ecstatic. Uh, I don't, I I don't would, think so. I would ask for a vote on the gentleman's uh, amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. No. And the amendment is not agreed to, and a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Willen? No. Willen votes no, Mr. Dreyer. No. Dreyer votes no, Mr. Goss. No. Goss votes no, Mr. Linder. Yes. Mr. Linder votes yes, Ms. Price. No. Ms. Price votes no, Mr. Diaz Villard. No. Mr. Diaz Villard votes no, Mr. Guinness. No. Mr. Guinness votes no, Mrs. Walpole. No. Mrs. Walpole votes no, Mr. Mowen. Yes. Yes, Mr. Bielinson, yes. Mr. Bielinson votes yes. Mr. Frost? Yes. Mr. Frost votes yes. Mr. Hall? Yes. Mr. Hall votes yes. No. The uh, clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Is there further discussion or amendment to the resolution? Chairman, I, I have an amendment to the rule, and I would move that the committee amend the rule by adding a motion to recommit with or without instructions. Um, as you know, Mr. Chairman, this motion to recommit with or without instructions is, is the traditional right of the minority party, and I think by denying us the right, you are closing down the process, denying the House the ability to decide whether or not we want to send this bill back to conference. We don't really get any kind of uh, shot at this bill. And, and under the recommittal, that's the only shot we get. It's a large bill. 
There's not going to be a lot of debate on it. This funds the whole government. There's been a lot of radical changes in it. And we don't even get our chance. Now, apparently some things have happened in the past, but we've never had a bill like this. Never had a bill like this. The minorities always had a chance to have their no. say. <laughs> well, Tony, your, your points are well taken. Uh, the point is we are in a very uh, serious situation now where the government is shut down. Uh, we had sent the, uh, a continuing resolution to the president, which uh, I personally thought was very reasonable, and so did many of the people on your side of the aisle. I think there were 48 Democrats that voted for it, uh, and certainly any time you get 48 Democrats agreeing with, uh, with the Republicans, it means there is, uh, there's a lot of merit to it. And uh, because uh, the president uh, told, uh, I assume he's vetoed it by now, but he told uh, Dan Rather, <laughs> on CBS that he was going to veto it. Uh, because of that, we just have to move this reconciliation package, and we cannot have it uh, uh, referred back to conference uh, uh, with instructions. Uh, that delay would, I think, jeopardize uh, many of the, uh, the workers today. I think uh, even uh, Steny Hoyer from your side of the aisle would object to tr uh, vehemently uh, to any kind of delay that would keep the government workers uh, off the payroll. So having running. said that, um, we're only talking about a delay of about 15 minutes here. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> We're talking about a recommittal motion. It well, doesn't take very long. Well, that's assuming we would vote it down. Right, if, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if it were to pass, it would take a lot longer than that. Um, May I it, just add one quick word? Quickly, if you I could, was just please. We were just reminded by, by staff that, that we didn't allow instruction of uh, recommittal with instructions last year because we were afraid we were going to lose it. But you guys are going to win yours, so you have nothing to worry about. <laughs> and you could look and you could come off looking good and give us what we want at the same time and, and end up with what you've got. Well, I would just say to Mr. Bielenson, around here, you never know. You know, we, uh, the Republican Party stands for a strong national defense. And yet the Republican Party, uh, certain members were responsible for voting down a defense appropriation bill, which was totally irresponsible. Uh, and uh, fortunately, we brought it back and passed it. We can't afford to delay this this time. You've, I, I think we all understand the gentleman's uh, amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. And uh, roll call, the nays Mr. have Chairman. it. The amendment is not agreed to, and a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Roll call. 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 Roll Yes. No. The uh, clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Is there further discussion or amendment to the uh, resolution? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. Um, I had an additional amendment, which I will not offer at this time, uh, regarding the time uh, for debate. I was going to suggest that there should be six hours, as there was last year. It's obvious, since you won't consider four, that you wouldn't consider six. Right. I will tell you this. I think what your side has done is absolutely outrageous, uh, putting members' travel plans ahead of an adequate discussion of this perhaps the most important consideration of the bill. I mean, justification that members have, are worried about their flights and if they've made schedules and they want to go back home, uh, I think is uh, a very poor justification for not giving adequate time to consider this matter. Gentleman Niels. And also, sure. as far as saying that you have to stick to the two hours because of the ma majority leader's explanation of uh, the time, that was one of the most flimsiest explanations I've ever heard. It, it had about one or two days sliding either way. So I'm sure that uh, if we put two hours on this thing, nobody would ever even notice it. But the American people might feel that it was a fair deal for all sides to be heard on this matter. Most Mr. Dreyer. Dreyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let, let me just say that we have many items that are going to be considered over the next couple of days on the House floor. And we very much want to, as quickly as possible, give President Clinton the opportunity to sign this reconciliation bill. And that's why... Getting it to him two hours uh, quicker will, I think, uh, give him a time to look at it and uh, sign this measure. So I think it's a very positive move. Gentlemen, continue to yield. Mr. Gus. As I recall, the travel schedule called for us to be gone by Thursday night, so we long ago abandoned that. And in fact, we are going to be here doing a critical nation's business tomorrow on Friday. Gentlemen, and Continue yield. on Saturday, of course. I just understand the cloakroom is going to serve turkey dinner next Thursday. <laughs> 
If you're inviting me over to your side, I'd be very happy to accept. Listen, uh, I'd prefer to have the turkey sent to me at home in uh, Glens Falls, New York. Uh, Can you be more specific with the address? I mean, you might get an offer. <laughs> and Mr. Bokley, you and your wife are invited. Uh, if, there's, uh, if there's no further amendment uh, to the resolution, all those in favor of reporting this resolution will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. And uh, evidently the yeas have it, and the amendment is agreed roll to. Roll call. Uh, but a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Will it? Aye. Will it vote aye, Mr. Dreyer? Aye. No. Voting no? No. No. Yes. The clerk will announce the results. And the uh, amend the resolution is agreed to, and the resolution uh, uh, is uh, reported. And Mr. Dreyer will carry for the. Uh, for the uh, majority and for M the minority. M Mr. Bielenson of California will carry for the minority. Both the House and Senate plan to begin debate on the Budget Reconciliation Conference Report, or what the Republicans call a balanced budget conference